What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. And I'm your host, Supreme Decisions. Today, for those of you that can see, I'm actually at a resort style room here in Atlanta. And it was kind of an extended gift, you know, unknowingly for the most part. Because, you know, you had people that wanted to reach out and offer your boy an opportunity. Well, with that opportunity, I'm looking to take advantage of it in some aspects. But for those who cannot see, I am in the age of nice, gloomy, rainy day. But one of the things I want to talk about today is oftentimes we talk about the blue line. We talk about the police officer's code of silence. There's this thing that if you look at a problem long enough, you either become part of that problem or you start looking for solutions. Well, oftentimes you hear me speak about the officer's behavior, the officer's training, the officer's educational pretty much prowess. Today, I'm actually going to address the actual problem because if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. And a lot of times we're blaming blue line and we're not looking at where the blue line actually starts and where it ends. That is the police unions. The police unions are the holders of the blue line. And that's the title of today's podcast. Because the police unions created policing in a political Forum. Most of us had no idea that police unions are some of the greatest or largest donors to those that are running for office, whether it's DA, president, or even local governor. Why is that? Why are they donating to these candidates for the most part? Why are they doing that? The idea is to influence prosecutions and sway officer sentencing. Just to give you an example, Kim Porter was found negligent using her gun instead of a taser and killing Dante Wright. Kim Porter was convicted of multiple counts of manslaughter because, you know, the average sentence on manslaughter is five years. Kim Porter was sentenced to two. Kim Porter had also lied to her bail bondsman. She didn't even live in the city anymore. Kim Porter had also done other things that was pointed out by the prosecutor at the time of the conviction. Kim Porter will probably only serve less than a year for murder. When you're talking about the influencing of prosecutions, the swaying of officer sentences, I did a podcast probably about six months ago in which I spoke about police officers murdering someone on average 10 years. And at the time, we had two officers that were sentenced to more than 10 years, two. Yet, if someone murders an officer, incidental or otherwise, the average is 48 years. An officer serves on average 15 months. Say that one more time. A police officer that murders someone serves on average 15 months. Tamir Rice's murderer served less than three years on a 15-year sentence. Tamir Rice's murderer has an opportunity to get another job as a police officer. Today, this podcast does sound somber, but it's understanding the issue at hand. 
Now, here's where I'm going to start getting deeper because even in later episodes, like I normally do for the most part, you're going to have an opportunity to not only hear, but you're going to be able to see the things that I talk about when I speak about the one thing that needs to be addressed and how to address it. The Supreme Court in 2018 offered an opportunity to sue unions. Say that one more time. In 2018, the Supreme Court offered an opportunity to sue unions. The first ones that were kind of put to the test in this were the police unions. The reason being is because the police union protected crooked cops from punishment. They kept crooked cops employed. They kept crooked cops funded and funded the lies on the stand and in paperwork. You often hear me talk about the stock language. Stop resisting. He went for my gun. I was in fear for my life. Not done in one police station. Not done or seen in one police state. These are the same exact verbiage that's used all across this country. That's a problem. Most of us don't see it that way because most of us don't want to look at it that way. Because if everybody's saying the same thing and the behavior is projected the same exact way, there has to be something done about the influence of that said thing. Now, one of the things, those of you that have worked with me before, or even listened to my earlier podcast, I speak about suing a police officer in their pers personal or individual capacity. Because this way, they don't have the protection of a police union. They don't have the protection of their union rep because you're not suing them as officer whatever. You're suing them as whatever, whatever. Mr. John Smith or Mrs. Johnita Smith or Mary Smith. You're using these contexts and offering an opportunity to weaponize your defense because once they break their policy, once they violate your civil rights, they are no longer acting as Officer Johnson. They are no longer a police officer. So taking a police officer into federal court is not the means in which getting the answers or remedy that you're looking for done. When we're looking at this. This is this for me, because like I told you, I have a lot of family members that are police officers. I have a lot of friends that are going into the policing business because that's what this is. This is a business. Understand and make no mistakes. That's what policing is. Oftentimes people tell me, oh, well, no, you, police don't have quotas. Yet Trevor Noah did an entire research package on police going after quotas. Don't remember anyone getting upset with Trevor Noah for doing that. He reinforced what I was saying. Then I went back and spoke about the lies that police officers were telling, lies police officers were using to fulfill quotas. I didn't use just one city. I didn't use just one state. I didn't use just one police department. I believe I gave you eight. Trevor Noah talked about New York. I gave you eight more, so that's a total of nine. And then I hear a lot of these people talk about, well, you don't know the situation on certain aspects of policing. But then I give you a story like Walter Chamberlain, senior. Then I give you the story of the two people in the car in Philadelphia. The, lying, the known lying police officer, the lying 
officer who stood on the hood of their car firing down into this car who said he was in fear for his life while the police were shooting at each other. These things happen. They happen because of the training. They're protected because of the unions. When you hear a California governor say, yeah, we wanna go ahead and get rid of police officer complaints and negative records if they have good behavior for 60 days. That's two months. If they have good behavior, if they do this, if they do that, but yet they don't want to correct that behavior. I wonder why. Because whenever I speak about police are in this for revenue generation, I'm a bad guy. When I speak about the context of this actually being something greater than what they're showing us, I'm the bad guy. Whenever I'm pointing out the actual perpetrators of the crimes, I'm the bad guy. But at the end of the day, no one questions these people that are actually committing these acts or perpetrating these actual crimes. I'm the bad guy. And it's easy to look at me. It's easy to point the finger at me because I'm nobody. It's easier to say, this dude on YouTube, this dude making videos, he's nothing. Ooh, he was a criminal. Ooh, he got charged with Rico. But it's often funny how those stories don't end at those statements. But when we talk about a police officer, it's where well, we don't have all the facts. But then when the facts start coming in, it's, well, that was just one mistake. That was just one police officer. But if I'm seeing it 50 times a day, if I'm seeing the same behavior 50 times a day, and you don't have to take my word for it. Ask Officer Dingle. He's a police officer. He actually said this. Why are they not smiling at me? I turn on the TV and I see this behavior. If the police are saying this behavior exists, if the person you don't like says this behavior exists, if others are watching this behavior exists, are you telling all of us that we're all wrong? Or am I just a bad guy for saying it to you and you're being able to hear it? When you're placing policing in politics, the government itself is supposed to be on the side of the people, supposed to be on the protection of the people. But when you're placing policing in politics and militarizing those police, say it one more time, policing, placing policing in politics, a little tongue twister, and militarizing these people. Who are you militarizing them for? I did a podcast. Yes, I do a lot of them where I spoke about equal force. I gave you a military directive that is used in Iraq. I gave you a military directive that is used in Iran. I even spoke about the context of that actually being used in places such as Germany, equal force. Which means if a dude is using a cell phone, you can't use a Glock. If someone has a knife, you can't use a Glock. If someone is running away from you, the word imminent means right now, immediate, present. If a citizen who is the greatest authoritarian on the planet can't shoot someone in the back that's running away from them because they're told by law that threat is leaving you. How it is a police officer using that exact same force as a servant, a public protector, whose fiduciary duty is to protect the public, 
allowed to shoot multiple people in their back and it's okay. Because when you're putting policing in politics, you're having these people that are unable to differentiate the things that are necessary to not only grow, but to actually expound on and be able to think on their feet. They're trained to be reactionary. They're trained that everybody is a criminal. They're trained that everybody's out to hurt them. But I'm the problem because I'm talking about the source of this, the protectors of this action, the protectors of this behavior, the protector of hiring those that don't think for themselves. A countrywide practice of hiring those that can't think for themselves. A countrywide practice of hiring those that can't think for themselves. Because I often tell people, there are police officers that follow me. There are police officers that listen to my podcast. I use the term or verbiage of trained attack dogs. They don't say anything because they're doing what they're trained to do. I talk about the vigorousness of defense attorneys that aren't present. Yet I still had a defense attorney on the show. He spoke about the things he does. He also spoke about where he's doing them and how and what level he does them. I've even interjected in his conversation to speak about going more in depth. These things themselves are all relevant because at the end of the day, if you don't know or you don't understand what it is I'm saying, the reinforcement of it has to come from outside of me. I'm offering those opportunities. Just like when the police union spoke up about the incident in Arizona about Starbucks, I spoke up. And I also showed the article where I didn't do the research again. The Arizona Courier did. The paper from Arizona, I actually posted it on Twitter after they told me I was bullying the police union for stating what was in the article, for stating what the Arizona, the Phoenix police chief said on national TV. When I spoke about the Arizona Police Department killing someone at least one every five days, that was their average. They were killing an unarmed citizen once every five days. The police chief in Phoenix said it was the citizen's fault for being shot. And then when they brought up the fact that the child was at a playground that was shot in the head by a police officer, I got flagged for bullying. I'm often asked whenever I'm posting something, is this controversial? For me, it's not because this is educational. Controversy comes in those that don't want you understanding the truth. They don't want you knowing the truth. They want you stuck behind blinders. That's where the controversy comes in. At. I don't think anything I'm saying is controversial because everything I'm saying is out in front of you. Today could have been a red pill video or podcast, but it's not because at the end of the day, it doesn't need to be because you're getting the truth anyway. You're getting what's laid out in front of you anyway. The wool is coming from over your eyes anyway. Now, Here's, here's one of the things I talked about too, because I'm going to be, I'm going to get into this too, because the level of political funding is astonishing to me. The world shut down March, I want to say 12th or 13th, 2020. I was actually on someone else's show. Can't remember, but I was asked on the means of this during the pandemic. It wasn't in March, it was later on. 
What did I think was going to happen once the police are allowed to go back to policing? Well, I use psychology because understanding the dynamics of those with lower IQ levels. You take someone that hasn't been able to do what they do for, let's say, four months. They're going to be more aggressive. Some places, they it was as long as nine months without having the opportunity to regularly police, to regularly engage with citizens. Because the craziest number that I heard was 75% of all Americans have their initial contact with police through a traffic stop. I looked at a stat of places where most of your police misbehaving or bad actions resulted from. These were the cities where you had them lobbying for the police to stop doing traffic stops. Why? Because when I said Ren v. U.S. did not state a traffic stop was a crime. Whoops. Did the police apologists miss that one? I think they did. When I stated that Ren v. U.S., they never stated a traffic stop was a crime. They stated it was lawful, but it was not a crime. Now you have 36 major cities across this country saying we're going to stop traffic stops because they aren't crimes. When you look at the police officers, the 20 plus police officers I named a couple of podcasts ago that were planting drugs on people, that were planting guns on people, they were planting fentanyl and meth on people. It wasn't just in one place. It was during a traffic stop where they created a scenario for a false search. One guy did it over 400 times. Had another guy get caught falsifying 30 plus stops themselves. You have a group that are being protected to the tune of half a million dollars a year on average for a sitting party. That would mean Democrat or Republican. And I'm gonna say that one more. They're offering the sitting party a half a million dollars a year. Now, doesn't seem like a whole bunch, but when it's loose money, when it's throwaway money, that's a lot. But I, I'm, I'm gonna get into I'm gonna get deeper into those numbers because the surface money is putting a, putting a half a million dollars in someone's pocket that they didn't earn per year. I'm going to, uh, wait, wait, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. It's, I'm coming. $2 billion over the last 20 years for over 55 police unions across the country. The question is why? Because they're putting policing in politics to influence police policy. The greatest, the states with the greatest amount of money going towards police policy influence. New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. Where are the three worst police departments in the country? New York, Stop and Frisk, did you remember that? Thank you, Rudy. And it was actually reinforced and amplified during Rudy. It wasn't implemented during Rudy. Just understand that. The LAPD, I think we remember Rodney King. Well, at least some of us do. Chicago. Chicago with the constant going into wrong homes, doing false raids, turning off body cameras and doing other things that are outside the scope of natural policing. That's what, 
But again, why? Why is that okay? Why is that an option? Why is that the norm at this point? Because we're putting policing in politics. Because a year ago it was 60. This year is 150. Getting it wrong once, okay. Getting it wrong twice, all right, man, you got to pay attention. Getting it wrong 60 times, that's intentional. And when I talked about coming out being more aggressive, what I didn't tell you was the aggressiveness stemmed from not being able to police properly. And in 2021 was the most violent year on record since they started counting with 1,055 police involved shootings, almost triple the national average over the past three years. 1,055 police involved shootings. I want you to let that marinate a little bit. The most violent year, right after the year they were un, not allowed to do any policing. The most violent year after a year of not being able to do any policing. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. When I talk about this, even the context of the conversation, let's put it that way, the context of the conversation becomes something different. Because I'm giving you what it is. I'm showing you what it is. I'm telling you what it is. It's up to you to actually see it. And that's where the story comes in. Because can you see what I see? Do you feel what I feel? Are you able to grasp the things I'm handing you? Better question is, do you want to grasp the things I'm handing you? Most of the stuff I'm giving you goes against the programming. Even when I talked about the propaganda, it goes against everything that you've learned and know. Still doesn't change the facts. The unions spend $10 million annually to influence law enforcement policy and thwart pushes for reform, i.e. officer involved excessive force complaints, i.e. the police reform bill. Because while a lot of us was out, defund the police, defund the police, defund the police, defund the police. The problem is self-governing, self-control. Most of us, the majority of us don't have it. Because one of the things that I get up every morning and I say to myself is keep the discipline. Because the discipline itself doesn't make me or break me, but it allows me to get better. Keeping the discipline allows the simple fact of getting up and going through the act of doing what it is I need to do. Keeping the discipline. That's what self-governing is. Most of us don't have that ability. As most of us would like it, it's not plausible. It's not one of those things that you can actually get to and it means something. That's a problem. That's why you can't defund the police. But you can ask for them to be retrained. But when I read you that bill, retraining wasn't in there. You can ask for a more educated subject, one that'll ask questions, one that'll actually think before pulling the trigger. That's not in there. You can ask for the things that correct that problem. But... Are you bringing $10 million to the table when you're having that conversation? Because the police union is. They're sitting now annually. 
$10 million in hand and handing it to those with the greatest influence to make sure their attack dogs can continue attacking. They can make sure that their revenue generation stream can keep generating streams. Yeah, yeah, got a little noty notes over here. I want you to understand. Yeah, that's what you hear the paper rustling. Those that are, you can see the writings on the wall, or in the book in this case. When you're talking about destruction of wrongful police actions, when you're talking about these files being gone in 60 days, 90 days, why don't they do that with those that they arrest? Because again, we know those that are arrested are deemed criminals. They know that that orange jumpsuit reminds people of criminality due to the programming. If you're getting rid of a police officer's record in 60 days, why aren't you pushing for these people to be put in front of a judge within those 60 days? Why aren't you forcing the prosecutor to actually turn over discovery within 60 days? Why are you not doing these things? Because again, it starts then to become part of a speedy trial. But even in that, I can look up someone's arrest record 30 years later. Why can't I look up a bad police officer's actions 30 days later? Why are they trying to shield that? If we can go and grow into something else, why is it we can't become what's needed to become better at what we're doing? Understanding that question, just, 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 just let, let it sink in for one moment. There's this thing that police officers use called pain compliance. You know, that's when you use a pressure point. And in their case, it's meant for de-escalation. The problem is, it's generally used in points of escalation by the police officer. is often used as a form of torture during that said escalation. Just to give you a couple of examples, there was a police officer in Florida. There was a man having a conversation with two other police officers that were present on the scene. Sound familiar? Because I've given this story probably a thousand times about multiple different people. Two officers on the scene, they're having a conversation. Third officer shows up and begins to escalate the situation, which this lieutenant did. Lieutenant comes over and begins to yell, scream, and forcefully push the person that they're, the other two police officers are having a conversation with. The other two police officers has a third as a backup. So they're pretty well versed. They got, they got it stuck. Nobody's in cuffs. They're having a conversation until it becomes a shouting match by a third person who was not there originally. One of the original officers then go and handcuffs the man to kind of separate the lieutenant, the trainer of these officers, from this said suspect. The lieutenant begins to shout, uh, continues to push the handcuffed man, then pulls out his pepper spray. Pepper spray is used for pain compliance. This man isn't resisting arrest. This man is talking. Well, this lieutenant has one of his other cadets kind of intervene and gently, and I actually mean that from the form of she put her arm around his waist and kind of guided him away from the suspect while he had the pepper spray out before he could pe pepper spray the suspect who wasn't really a suspect at the moment. This lieutenant then turned around and choked his cadet and swung at her a couple times. 
The police union is not only working to get this man his job back, who on his own video showed he escalated, not de-escalated, showed he violated department policy, not followed it. He then assaulted a fellow police officer who has a duty to intervene. The police union is getting this man his job back as well as back pay. The police union is not only getting this man his job back for all of those crimes and violations, but he's getting them back. The police union is getting him back pay. So even if you can't fire them, they're still getting paid. But I'm the problem. Just keep that in mind when we're talking about, you know, why police, people don't like the police. Because I mean, I've said this a thousand times. People, it's not a dislike of actual police. Pretty sure people love police. They don't like, they have a dislike against improper policing. I don't think anybody has a problem with the police. I think they have a problem with the systematic policing that is currently enforced in this country right now. That's the where the problem comes in because the union is making sure this current policy that is problematic continues. Now I'm getting ready to talk to you police officers for a second because I want you guys to pay attention to something. Because I gave you the numbers of which they're doing to allow you to continue doing the things that you are doing. The FBI studies pull up police domestic violence is at a rate of 15 times the general public. Say that one more time because again, it shocked me. I thought it was a little less, but I knew it was high because I knew they were the highest group of domestic violence. Didn't realize it was 15 times the general public. And the FBI deemed it actually could be higher because of the general code of silence. They're told no snitching. Former police officers like Eddie T. Johnson encouraged the blue wall and no snitching. You know, similar to the incident in Houston where the boyfriend was a firefighter. The girlfriend was a police officer. The firefighter had to shoot the police officer because she came up to his job waving her gun. Oh, you didn't hear about that in the news. That, that wasn't in the news. But I'm the problem. I want you to understand something. I was often told a lot of times the cover up is worse than the crime. It never ceases to amaze me the amount of people that tell me Dude, you are saying things I never heard. And I've been doing this 15 years. I've been doing this 20 years. I've been doing this X, Y, Z, 30 years. I, you're saying things I've never heard. Now I'm going to say something else. Ready? 13% of the general public commit suicide. It increases to 1.7 with police officers. I'm, I'm, let me let me put that in context, because even just saying it like that is kind of skewed. 13% of police officers, or 13% of the general public, actually commit suicide. When you then put that number 
with the number of police officers, you're looking at almost 15% of police officers die by suicide. So it's a higher number of police officers that are dying by suicide than it is in the general public. The highest are California, Florida, Texas, and New York. Remember that list from earlier where I talked about the protection? The protection states, the, the high ones, California, New York, most other one, Chicago, California and New York are in the highest suicide rates as well. Police officers are more likely to die by suicide than they are by being in the line of duty. I'm going to say that one more time. Police officers are more likely to die by suicide than they are to die in the line of duty. Yet, they tell you, the police officer, everyone else is the criminal. Everyone else is scary. Everyone else is trying to hurt you. When in fact, their trained attack dog is hurting themselves. Their trained attack dog is a bigger threat to himself because of issues of mental health. Why are they paying for you to continue putting yourself in jeopardy, creating the fact that everyone that you deal with, I'm, 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 you know what, let me, let me back it up, just one, one little tad. I did a video on another channel um, about a week ago. I spoke about energy cannot be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred from one place to another. And that source has to be an outside source from where it's at. Police officers encounter people every day. And we're in that energy, we're in that feeling stage of this United States. We feel everything. Now, we understand that the greatest battery or the greatest energy source are the people. 95% of those people that you are encountering are negative. I can't think of a positive police encounter. Not one. But here's, here's what I want you to understand. You're picking up a little bit from those people every time you encounter someone negative. You're grabbing a little bit of that negative energy and you're taking it with you from stop to stop to stop. Some eight, some 15, some 14, some 16 hours. You're taking all of that negative energy and there's no place to get rid of it. You have no idea how to get rid of it. You have no source, no training, no function on getting rid of it. You're doing that four, five, six, seven times a week. Just build up after build up after build up after build up. And all that negative energy comes to a point of explosion. It may be an explosion on a suspect, which the police union wants you to keep doing. It may be an explosion on your spouse, which the police union is not caring too much about you doing it as long as they can stop it being reported and you continue doing what they want you to do. They don't care that you're eating your gun, that you're angry doing this job. They just want you doing the job. They don't care about your mental state. Show you how much they don't care. Because again, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. The problem I even I wrote this question down. It was it's kind of funny to me. Why aren't they trained to deal with their mental health issues? They're they're trained to use their gun. They're shot by a taser. They must be pepper sprayed to carry pepper spray. 
They must be mace to carry mace, but they're not trained to be shot. Now, the question is, if the brain remembers two things, pleasure and pain. Pain restricts the body from acting. The one thing that is their one lethal weapon, why are they not trained? Why are they not given pain from that lethal weapon? They're given pain from the hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're given pain from that pepper spray. They're given pain from that mace. They're getting pain from that taser. You know, the things that they're rarely seen using. Yeah, I actually paused for dramatic effect on that one because I want you to understand the context of what I'm giving this to you at. You're trained on everything else except that gun. You're trained just to shoot it. You're trained that everything that's in front of you is a threat. You're trained to eliminate that threat. But nobody's training you on how to release what happens after that threat is eliminated. Nobody's training you on what to do after your shift is over. Because most people, most police officers, what are they oh, I'm going down to the cop bar to suck down a depressant, to give me a little bit of liquid courage. You know, that's why cops are often done in, you know, bar fights. That's why you see a lot of these off-duty officers pulling the gun out on regular citizens. Here's here's why I want you want you. I just want I wanted to sink in just a little bit. You ready? They're taught to fear the public hurting them instead of offering continuous options to protect themselves from themselves. The police unions aren't lobbying for better educated cops or better education with the police that they have or have incoming. Yeah, because I'm actually going to do the story of the Georgia 106th class where 36, 33 of the 36 graduates were caught cheating and Georgia rehired 24 of them. So 24 people that couldn't pass a test is now on the road to set up something that's supposed to be a crime because they don't know what it is. Tommy Sotomayor. Police officers who don't know law. Police character on trial. The fact that they were brought up in a cheating scandal regarding their job. Understand these things. These are things that you can use that are weaponizing your defense. Understand this is not just something that you're going to just just use now. It's going to be something that comes in greater, hotter, whatever you like to call it, but it's going to be something different for you. Several studies. The IQ below 110, because again, we did um, with that Jordan B. Prince, talked about the IQ levels of police officers. IQ below 110 offered a higher rate of being prone to violence. Yes, I pause for dramatic effect because I want you to catch that one. If I tell you that the majority of police officers have an IQ lower than 110. And I then tell you the psychological studies show that those with IQs lower than 110 have a prone, that are prone to violence. I then tell you that the police officers have the highest rate of domestic violence, the highest rate of suicide. The, I can go through this. At some point, does it stick? At some point, do you see what it is I see? Because yes, I give you pieces. And then I come back later and I show you how those pieces go together. Because the one thing I did, my father was a contractor. He was a construction guy. 
The one thing he told me was the most important thing of any building, any structure, was the foundation. A lot of times you had to work on the foundation several times before you can actually get it to erect anything. Whether it's a statue, whether it's just even pouring the slab, you have to get and make adjustments to the foundation first. The foundation has to be sturdy. The foundation has to be level. The foundation has to be pristine in order for anything to be built upon it. That's why I'm giving it to you piece by piece because if I try to give you the entire foundation at one time, there's nothing that you can do to erect it straight or properly. Now, when we looked at those same studies, those that had an IQ higher than 110 had a lower rate, or as they would call it, a medium rate. But those that had an IQ between 120 and 130, which are those that are generally, you, would, you wouldn't call them technically intellects, but you would talk, look at them in jobs that require them being meticulous. Those jobs or those people were in the almost least likely to be prone to violence as well as the rate you compare those two, those two groups below 110 and within the range of 120 and 130 there were signs of almost doubling the amount of violence ex exhilarated or illustrated by those with the IQ below 110. When you're talking about that transfer of energy, if 95% of the people that you come in contact with are in a hyper state, you get that energy. There was a movie called Falling. And a means of how this energy went around was it had to touch you. Had to, had to touch this. And it transferred just by the touch. Energy works that exact same way. Energy comes out and through the contact. Now, when we're talking about the police mental health, we're talking about the low education or low IQ levels. We're talking about these things, because again, I love to throw up Jordan V. Prince, because at the end of the day, these are not my words. Yes, I'm saying them, but these are things that are etched in the Supreme Court. I don't have to like it. It is what it is. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change this ruling. We're militarizing the violent, unintelligent individuals and protecting impulsive behavior through the police unions. They're putting $500,000 to the sitting party annually, but they're coming to the table with 10 million in funding every year for that sitting party to stop police reform, to stop police sentencing. Why is that? They won't even spend a tenth of that on a police officer's mental health. I'm going to get into that number exactly in just a few minutes. Ready? They, wanna, they won't put 10% of that on what is spent to put them in the line of fire to protect their mental health. They're actually spending over $100 million per year to allow the wrong behavior of police unions or police actors. Those that are being police officers right now 
are pocketing portions of that hundred million every year to perpetuate wrong behavior. And the police unions are not only backing it, they're funding it. We just have to accept it as it is. Now, when I talked about the 10, so we see the 10 million, we see the 100 million, so it's called 110 million in total. They're putting up $7 million for police mental health annually. Hundred million to protect the police, ten million to the sitting party, hundred and ten million to allow them to continue behaving in the manner that they're behaving. They then put up seven million for the police mental health. They're being trained. They're being punished for doing what they're trained to do. They tell them that the issue is the community. They tell them that you must follow this blue wall code of silence. Back to blue. But they're telling you and what they're telling you is hurting you more than it's helping you. I'm going to say that one more time. What they're telling you is hurting you more than it's helping you. And yes, you can back the blue. You can shoot me to do. At the end of the day, you are the one that's suffering from it. Because if I'm teaching someone to sue a police officer for their wrong behavior and I'm suing them in their personal capacity, the union isn't going to stop that action because you're no longer the union's problem. If the union's not invested in your mental health to make sure you're able to dispel all the energy that you're getting in every day, at least not as much as they are in your continued bad behavior. When you become an issue, you're no longer part of the solution for them. Understand that because every day they have a large pool to pick from. You remember the Kennedy speech in 1968 you remember Jay-Z? I dumbed down for my audience and doubled my dollars. Kennedy spoke about taking education from the children because they're easier to control when they're not intelligent. When you take away their ability to fight back. Understand. You are expendable when you become a problem. But I'm the bad guy for letting you know that the problem exists. I'm the bad guy that shows you where the loopholes are. I'm that bad guy for telling you to do your job properly. And the problem is you have no idea what your job is. And the police union is okay with that. Because when I ask you to do it the right way, I'm the problem. You've actually been... In Throw out a name. Just start name calling. Yeah, that's generally what happens when you're unable to articulate anything. You go to name calling. Doesn't change any of the facts, but the name calling makes you feel good. I guess we're going in closing. As you see, I'm closing the book. At some point, we're going to have to address the actual problems or issues of this country. Not only does it start with the police encounters, it concludes with the police unions. It concludes with us. 
we are the alphas and omegas of our own destiny and future and our current present. We have to make a decision that this current way or state of being is not proper and we're no longer going to accept it because the longer we accept it, the longer it's going to continue. And the longer it continues, the more detrimental it becomes. These corrections aren't going to be done through talking, not going to be done through wishing. It's going to be done through action. You're going to have to stand up. You know, I'm not going to do the Tupac today. But understand, a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. If you choose to allow bad behavior, you're part of the problem. 